Dear colleagues, I'm glad to introduce you Maxim Vladimirov. He was stu my student uh, and, and this is a very pleasure for me. Now he is a PhD and a senior uh, research scientist in Google research. And I uh, uh, am glad to blow a word to him. Please, Maxim. Thank you, Grigor Nikolaevich. I'm really glad to kind of come back to the my hometown in a way, virtually, um, or my home country. And I have a great pleasure to talk about to you about machine learning. Uh, this is something I've been doing for the last 10 years or so since I finished uh, university in Ukraine. In fact, uh, let me... By the way, if you, if there's any issues with uh, hearing me or anything, just let me know in the chat, please. Uh, so that, that's my Vita, so you're more familiar with uh, with what I do. So from 2003-2008, I was a, beach, a bachelor and a master's student in uh, computer science under supervision and great command of um, Grigor Nikolaevich Sholkevich and other professors here. Uh, then I moved to US and from 2009 to 2014, I was a PhD at the University of California, Merced, where I studied methods of nonlinear dimensional tree reduction. Um, one word uh, about that, that particular time. At that time, um, machine learning was not really popular discipline as it is right now. Uh, in fact, very few people kind of knew about it outside of computer science. Like nowadays, machine learning, pretty much anyone hear about it, even if they're not connected with computer science. Uh, it becomes like a buzzword. It becomes a lot of fuss. But when I started, it was just subfield of computer science, subfield of AI. And I started it because I was kind of trying to go back to more math-oriented uh, subjects and to more math. And uh, I was software engineer in Ukraine for like a couple of years, as many people who finished university in Ukraine. And I realized that I kind of want to do more mathy stuff, and I thought machine learning would be a nice intersection between uh, between these two things, mathematics and uh, computer science. And in the middle of my PhD, in the beginning, I remember 2009, 2010, when I was going to the first conferences, it was a very niche field. And it was mostly academics. Very few people would attend. Uh, we had all these like, interesting things, like we would people would give us backpacks or pens or different things you see uh, like as a free stuff because people were encouraged to go, right? It's kind of... Uh, the thing over time. And then 2012, everything changed. And uh, with advent, advancements of uh, deep learning, people started to realize it's how important it is and different companies start to invest more money. And nowadays, uh, you know, fast forward to, to now, uh, it becomes really a huge field with uh, conference tickets sold out within minutes and the attendance uh, skyrockets every year. We break new records of how many people are interested, how many people try to publish papers and attend the conferences. So it's really interesting to see the field changing so much over time, over just 10 years, right? Um, but back 2010, I was a PhD student. Um, I was studying problems of nonlinear non dimension introduction. And example of, see, example of this you see on the right, where um, this is a very typical standard kind of toy example, as you say of uh, handwritten digits, as you see on top. So different people write different handwritten digits. It's been cleared up. There's no noise. There is no artifacts. It's just like nice curve on a white background. And uh, what I start try to study, I try to figure out, uh, can we learn the structure of this particular data set? I mean, obviously, the methods can be applied for different data sets, but I particularly studied that one. And what you see on the bottom is the method of dimensional detection, a learning, so quote unquote, learning the structure of this data. In the beginning, you see it's kind of messy, and then slower and slower with more iterations, it kind of learns the structure. It learns that, you know, ones are different from sevens and from twos. By the way, computer doesn't see the color, the computer doesn't see the, any what we call supervised data. It just sees the digit itself, right? And the color I, all, I added for the for the for the easiness of uh, the viewers to see. Interestingly, you, if, once it settles, you can see also that it learns not only the separate different digits, but for, learns that sevens are close to nines and also close to fours, but also very different from twos. And also, you see within, for example, ones, it learns the slantiness of the one. So it learns really a structure of a data, not just what digit is. But because computer doesn't know what digits are in our understanding, it just sees a curve, the wiggle in a way, right? Uh, it learns also the structure of each individual digits, how relate to each other. 
So that's what I did for my um, PhD. I spent five years uh, looking at these kind of pretty pictures, published some papers, and then I uh, realized that machine learning actually has been taken off and uh, the new buzzword, which is deep learning, occurred. And I just unforeseen after my PhD, I joined research at Yahoo Labs, which at the time was one of the biggest uh, research labs in, uh, in research industrial labs in the world. Uh, there were a lot of talented people working there, and I was lucky enough to work on the, one of the first deep learning engine for um, for ranking web results. It never really saw the light of the day because uh, Yahoo Labs were going undergoing some changes, and the whole company was undergoing many changes at the time. It was very kind of uneasy moment for the company, and uh, I decided to leave in 2016, and I joined research and research at Google. And at Google, I was working on multiple uh, different projects. Uh, in the beginning, I was working, working on the search ranking. So actual results you see when you type different queries in Google search. Um, and then I switched recently, I switched a new team, and I work on the following um, problems, problem stability optimality of ML algorithms. So um, you will see later that if you run multiple times the same algorithm, you might actually have different results, because not because of your parameters, but sometimes because of randomness of your initialization. And how do we get a stable result? How do we get more stable results? Um, because it's really important for different applications, right? Because sometimes you're an algorithm and you had some results. And is it is your results you get good or bad because of your good initialization? Or it's because you just haven't tried many times now, right? Maybe you try more times and you're going to get better results, which is a really important problem. Uh, I also work on natural architecture search, um, which is the problem where you are... Typically, when you run machine learning algorithm, you need to define a structure of your, for example, network, right? If you work with neural nets, you need to define how many layers you would have and what structure for each layer is, right? Uh, neural architecture search tries to figure out what is the optimal structure of your network for a given problem, right? And finally, meta learning. I will actually talk about this particular topic in the end uh, when I look into the future of machine learning. I think it's a fascinating topic is basically the idea, can we learn machines to learn? Not only learn particular tasks, but teach them how to learn so that when they see new tasks, they will be better positioned to learn it. Um, for the agenda, um, I will roughly have four sections of different sizes, but um, bear, with me, bear with me on this. First one is I'm going to define a state of machine learning and AI as I see it. Uh, second, I will look at the life of machine learning algorithms, so to speak. So I will look into further uh, f uh, following five areas, sub areas of what machine learning algorithm is, and I will specifically emphasize things that I, I for non practitioners, is kind of swept under the rugs. Some things like feature selection, which I think it's really really important, and for many many people who go into machine learning right away, they immediately get frustrated because people don't talk about it, but it's really one of the most important thing of machine learning algorithm. Then I will talk about feature space transformation, which is actually bread and butter of a neural network. And I will talk why specifically neural networks and deep learning are where they are right now and what specifically, uh, what kind of transformation they, they actually able to achieve and why they become so popular. Then like an icing on the cake, the loss function, after you transform your features, you need to define your loss function, which gives you the error on your performance for your training data. And I will show different loss functions and see how they relate to each other and uh, how how to choose one properly. Then once you define the error function, you need to optimize your function, right? So your error functions basically give you univariate number, how good your method is performing, just one number, and you have to go down this, basically the slopes and the hills of objective function to get the better results, minimal or maximum. And finally, I talk about how to improve your algorithm by adding regularization and cross-validation, because once you achieve a good training error, it's actually not enough. You have to look at your test error as well and look at your performance and make sure that your algorithm actually does what you want it to do. In the third part, I will look into the future the way I see that and um, maybe try to understand different trends of machine learning for as of now and try to generalize them and provide the view of how the, how the, methods, how the methods and algorithms will move in the following years. And finally, I will look into resources uh, because I actually not really familiar with state of the arts in, I guess, most of the speakers are most of the presenters and people who in attendance are from Ukraine. So I think it will be useful for people from Ukraine as well, and as well as others. Uh, again, some resources that I find useful when I um, work with machine learning. Okay, let's go right into it. First one is state of machine learning algorithms, advancement in perspectives. Um, here is a brief, very brief timeline, very reductive timeline. 
of um, how I see machine learning kind of uh, achieved revolution in the last 10 years and where it's been. So it's actually started in 1930s when the first time the term neural networks with respect to uh, artificial intelligence were coined, but it wasn't until 1978 when Rosenblatt Perceptron started and it's really re revolutionized kind of the idea how we think about neural nets because, hey, now we have this very simple neuron essentially that can do similar things that neuron in the brain does, but it's able to achieve some learning capabilities, right? So we have this very simple function when, function when we saturate um, function, then we activate it and then it spits out some some signal and then you, if you stuck all of them in a layer in a way that you can achieve some learning, which was a very revolutionary idea at the time. And then in back in 70s or 80s, the people people argue when this was the first time it was coined and introduced, people introduced backpropagation, which is a way to actually learn those weights. Not we don't just define those weights that achieve learning, but we can teach them, we can learn them so they can learn automatically how to achieve your performance. The AI field that time was dominated by decision trees and first order logic, which were some of them were still used up to now. Decision trees are very much so used in a, in a big corporations because they have very nice interpretability qualities and people also know how to train them well. Then in, in 80s, people understand, hey, we can actually stack those layers of perceptrons together and achieve kind of, in a way, early deep learning results. Um, and in the 90s, 90s, uh, 90s what, what had been called as first AI winter, some people call it like that, I don't really like this name because a lot of advancement achieve, were achieved at that time, like SNN, LSTM, CNN, and LSTMs, which has been used right now extensively, like a lot of times. And it's it's few people know that actually been discovered back in back in nineties. Um, but it was AI winter in a way that I remember even when I started my PhD in two thousand nine. If you go to a conference and you see the word neural network, you're surprised. And it was very much so in the nineties as well, where if you do machine learning and if you do neural networks, you kind of have to fight this uphill battle of reviewers and other people who at that time didn't know, didn't understand that it has so much potential. And the field was mostly limited by kernel methods, which is the way to achieve nonlinear transformation um, in a differentiable way and achieve very good results. And there's a lot of actually very, very, very good result research done in this area. And in some way, this field still exists as a niche subtopic of machine learning. And there are some really good results, actually. In 2000, uh, when I started my PhD, for example, one of the hot areas were spectral methods, when, again, you can achieve uh, nonlinear performance means you can get beyond linear, you can get better results. Nonlinear almost always means better than linear. Not in terms of in terms of results, not in terms of interpretation, but still. But spectral methods were able to achieve kind of both because they were on one side they were convex, meaning that you have a global minima, you don't have to fight different local minima. They were easy to optimize. In fact, many times you can optimize it in a closed form, and you achieve pretty good results. And at the same time, uh, Netflix came up with its own price. Uh, back at, now it kind of sounds like a joke, but back at the time it was a huge deal when Netflix offered one million dollars for a best recommender system that. It will be able to match users to movies. So you have a database of users, database of movies, and you have a very sparse information of which users like which uh, movies, uh, which is given by a teacher. And then you have to fill the rest of the entries, right? If I like uh, this and that movie and someone else likes some other movies, right? And if those mov our movies match, that means most likely we like similar movies and I recommend other person the movies. And at the time, it was a big deal, like $1 million for early 2000s, or like, I guess, middle 2000s. Um, it was a big deal, and a lot of people started working on this, and it kind of advanced the field a lot as well. I remember there were a lot of a lot of papers and the conferences actually talking about that. Convex realization was a big deal, and I guess I mentioned like spectral methods are part of convex methods, and there are a lot of methods like that that basically try to convexify your issues, like lasso organization and others. When you try to give very hard problem that's hard to learn, and instead we propose convex relaxation of that method. And 2012, when I think that's where it started. So um, I clearly remember this conference, and I went uh, to see this AlexNet. I was curious what it's about. And the conference room was filled to the brim, and it was a big room. It was, well, big, again, again, compared to now, standards is like a joke, but it was like 100 people room, auditorium, it was filled, people were standing, which is now totally normal. Now pretty much every single workshop and uh, talk you go to, it's filled with people, but that time it was it was unheard of. Like usually you have 20, 30 people, now you have 100 plus. And the, I'm gonna talk specifically what made that particular paper um, 
so special and why it was the beginning of, of uh, deep learning as we know it. But the idea is that, first of all, it was actually, it was stated on a, on a few important, very important pillars. First one, at that time, large-scale learning, also big, big data, was abundant. So like a few years ago, internet kind of took, really took off. And people started putting a lot of data on the internet. And in a way, that helped uh, this revolution as well, because now we have a large data to learn from. And it's very important for machine learning algorithm. Then what Alex did, he did proposed end-to-end -end learning. And I will talk about what, what, what I mean by this. But essentially, it means that we don't have to define our own features right now. We can define things basically end-to-end. -end. We can start with raw pixels. And again, we end with a specific function we want to minimize and specific error we want to minimize. Again, sounds very normal now, but at that time, it was kind of revolutionary. And finally, and I guess it should, be, should come first, which is GPU training, uh, where uh, basically we uh, use GPUs in order to train the algorithm. And GPUs actually graphic processing unit. Again, now it's obvious, but at that time, it wasn't obvious that you can use them for training at all, right? I actually remember meeting Ilya Suskaver, one of the authors of this paper, year prior, and he told me what he's working on. And I thought, how boring it is. You have to work in this very specific subdomain of GPU training. You have to work with this CUDA code and which is very, very low level. And you actually train an algorithm that's already there because actually I never said anything about algorithm. Algorithm, algorithm for the most part was already there. Um, and the training on GPU was actually quite quite interesting and quite, um, quite surprising that he was working on that. But in a way he kind of foresee, foresee the future because that now everyone, everyone does that. Anyway, 2014, that's where GAN, which is a generative adversarial network, started. And I'm going to talk about some examples of that. Uh, basically, it's a network that achieved almost state of the art performance on the generation tasks. Uh, 2016, where the bunch of uh, new advancements come, come around. First one is AlphaGo Alpha Zero. It's the games that, it's algorithm that able to beat some very important games such as Go and Chess. And Alpha Zero actually can do it without no human supervision, just with self play. And Transformers. Uh, which now is a buzzword. It's one of the most important things of the last of this decade, I would say, or well, last decade as well, um, where they able to achieve a very nice performance on NLP tasks, and now it's slowly going to vision problems as well. Bird 2018 is basically some modification on top of Transformers, which made it work extremely well for translation and for many, many uh, uh, neural uh, NLP tasks. And then last this year, GPT-3 came out, which actually works on top of Transformers as well, uh, which is very revolutionary ideas of a huge model that built on top of basically much um, all data from the web. And I'm going to show some examples of how this works. Um, OK. So um, I'm going to give you some examples of where I see, I see the machine learning has been the most prominent. It's by far not complete. I just cherry pick some of the things that I like personally, but there are a lot of different results. First one, um, just as a group in things together, uh, what I call data sensing, right? So uh, something that we as a human can sense, something, some data that come from nature, uh, I think it's mostly solved. So uh, what we see, what we hear, and how we talk, it's again, it's governed by the, if you think about it, it's role, uh, rules of physics, right? Because image, it's not given by the humans, right? Humans can edit it and it's actually going to be harder for computer, I think. But if you just take a raw picture of a nature, so the quote, or a natural object, I think we can solve that. Most of the things we solve already. And on the bottom left, you can see the graph of how the accuracy on the very specific benchmark called ImageNet has been growing over time, and now we go into 90s, and now we actually almost hitting the this this the ceiling of maybe the labels are noisy already, or maybe there are multiple objects on the screen, and a computer actually is not able to recognize which one is which. So we are actually almost hitting the the top performance on this particular data set, and people are talking about okay, what's beyond that? What can we do something different than image that? Um, on the right, you see the evolution of translation. Over time, uh, the title of the slide, I'm not sure how much you can see, is uh, is the years and quarters. And as you see in the beginning of 2007, and the, by the way, the x-axis is single language. So now we go in the 50, 60 languages, 70, 80 languages. And the y, the vertical axis, is the blue score, so to speak, which is the quality of your translation. This is not the perfect score, but it's kind of rough, roughly corresponds to how good translation is. And as you see, both number of languages and uh, vertical, which is the quality of the translation, grows over time. And then finally, you see this green uh, bump, which is May 2020, 
where they introduced this BERT idea, which I um, described a little bit before, which is the idea of using transformers for translation. And this is just a Google, by the way. This is I'm just talking about quality of Google papers. Um, and this is pretty impressive, I think. Uh, next, I'm going to talk about generative algorithms. And uh, you can generate many things. You can generate text generation, phase generation, music generation. And again, the advancement that's uh, amazing, right? Like on the bottom left, you see this face. This face actually does not exist. This person does not exist. And you have to really, really squint to understand that actually this is generated by the algorithm, not the, not the, it's not a photograph, which is not, right? I mean, it's still now, it's been, what is it, six, or oh, not six, like four years since algorithm come out, and I'm still surprised. Like, I cannot believe that this person doesn't exist. If you like cats, this cat is also fake. It actually does not exist. It never existed which is again, amazing. It's generated completely by the algorithm. If you want, you can go to a website called, like on the bottom right, you can see this person doesn't exist or this cat does not exist.com. And you can just click through the photos. It's not just one, I just happen to cherry pick one result. They have amazing results. And every single photo you see is you're surprised, like, wow, how can this person not exist? On the bottom right, you see example, I just like, it just came out two days ago, which is, uh, I think it's a really neat idea, very helpful for our, our COVID times. Uh, on the left, you see the original video, video feed from the uh, from some speaker talking, right? And then what they did in the middle, they essentially just captured the photo of his face and then sent special markers of the location of the eyes, nose, eyes, in order to reconstruct the face. And this is very important for, for example, low latency data connection. If you talking from somewhere where internet is not stable, where you might just need to send few few dots of your face, might send a, send a photo through, and then you're gonna have very nice reconstruction and it's gonna work magically. You're gonna have HD in a way, video feed with very, very low latency. In fact, on the right, you can see that even they can rotate like some speakers. They not look in the camera. In fact, using this algorithm, you can actually turn the face, so, so to speak, turn the face, right, of the speaker in order for speaker to face face the camera. And finally, on the top, this is the GPT-3 system that I described a bit earlier. This is like a latest kid in the block, like one of the best results. This is a gigantic system that able to incorporate 170 billion neurons. In comparison, human, human brain has around 85 billion neurons. So it's actually like in a way two human brains. It was trained on, from what I understand, pretty much all the data on the internet. <laughs> I don't know how, I mean, obviously not everything, right? But whatever they could get to scrape it. And it achieved Im impressive results, right? So um, people use it for, for many things, like on the right, this Elon Musk teacher thing. It basically, people can provide a very simple text, like in this case, Elon Musk, or like the person person's name. And then the uh, algorithm will generate text, like for example, in this case, like teach me about rockets, uh, rockets, Elon Musk. All right, uh, rockets can be used for launching objects in space, including people and satellites. Rockets are typical powered by, typically powered by rocket fuel, such as liquid propellant rocket, and so forth. Right. So this whole text is fake, right? It's not. It didn't exist on the internet before. It's not like it copy and paste somewhere. This whole text is fake. In fact, if you run it multiple times, you're gonna have different. Um, different texts. I play with the system a little bit and it's just impressive. You can also, you don't have to use it this way, you can use it many other ways. Like you can have it as a, just a chat between the user, like me in this case, and the system. And I could not fool it. Like I try to talk about nature, I try to talk about um, some things that are very specific for California, like politics maybe, and it's able to answer very coherently, grammatically correct. And it's just a really impressive how it works. In the middle, finally, you see this system also built on top of the GPT-3 because they actually provide API. You can buy for like 100 bucks a month or something like that. You can buy API and can, you can build as a developer, you can build your own system to query their, their system, right? And that's actually, I think, how they're going to make money, which is interesting way. Um, I think it's first time that someone, or one of the first times to someone of research award from pretty much one of the big, big, biggest company out there is using the machine learning as an API for something else. But I think that's how it's gonna move forward, right? People gonna release their uh, train, because training costs a lot. Like they're training their system, I don't wanna lie, but cost in the tens millions of dollars just to train it. The computation, I mean, I'm talking about, not about the uh, cost for the developers, I'm talking about the actual power that you need to train this algorithm. So anyway, the middle section, that last section I haven't described, is basically people use this API 
to uh, create, for example, search engine, right? In this case, I mean, it's not impressive from Google perspective, right? Because Google already does it, but it's impressive because it essentially just queries API of this one system that does all the things at once. It doesn't have to be tailored to be a search engine. You can just ask it how many carbons are in a beneath, uh, benzene, and it says, hey, there are six atoms, six hydrogen, six carbon, carbon atoms. And that's it, right? One second. Um, someone said about correcting presentation, but I mean, I think I, I can do it later. Um, this is another example of generative algorithms where on the top left, you see the uh, query image, the target image, and then you see different styles. As you see this in different instats, you see different styles and then the image can transform, can be transformed using these styles. Um, I think it's very impressive for artists specifically, like a lot of uh, people are skeptic about can AI be used for art? And I think I think the answer is resounding yes. I mean, the, I think the pictures here are as artsy you can as, as it gets. I mean, obviously, an eye, eye of the holder, and many people might disagree, but I think that's pretty impressive that machines can create art nowadays. And I uh, have a lot of examples like that, specifically with music. I was hesitating to put uh, examples from music in the slides because I'm not sure it's going to you know, work well with uh, with remote. But if you um, spend some time looking into, like, for example, a project called, called Magenta, they have amazing results of simulating the whole orchestra. Or uh, very recent, I think it's called Jukebox from OpenAI. They're able to simulate different bands. So like how would uh, Avril Lavigne new album sound like or how would Beatles new sound like. And it's kind of noisy, but you kinda, if, you, if, you, if, you hear, if you hear what you want to hear, you will hear it. It's pretty impressive. It's non-trivial at all. It's a very nice result. And um, this is just the beginning, right? We just started essentially. Like it's been 10 years and it's uh, more and more applications come out. Like if you just type in Wikipedia applications of AI, uh, you would see this giant list of 25, 26 different just areas, right? Where AI is used. And if I, I found really curious that one of the content items is actually list of applications. So you're looking for applications and one of the list items is called list of applications. And if you go there, you see like on the right, you see a huge list of additional applications that like apparently wasn't covered. But um, someone said that they can't hear the speaker. I think it's I think it's mostly okay, right? It's just one person. From my side, I see everything's okay. Can someone confirm they can hear me? Okay, all right, it's fine, thanks. Um, all right, so basically it's surprising, right? You have so many applications and within applications you have more applications, right? And it touches pretty much everything. And as I, one, of the, one of the message I wanna, I wanna convey today is that machine learning becomes this essentially a tool, right? That you can use anywhere where you have data. In government, uh, health industry, job market, marketing, anywhere, it becomes this, this tool you can actually, pull, almost like a plug, right? Whenever you have data, to have some kind of understanding of what data, uh, what data looks like, or how we can analyze it, and it becomes easier and easier. In the in the last part of this talk, I will talk about different resources you can use. It becomes very easy to uh, to do that. This is an example of see how things are changing. This is I think I mentioned this a bit briefly before. Uh, this is a number on the left side. You can on actually both both sides of this of this plot. You can see the number of attendance of people. Uh, of of the of this one of the biggest conference called NeurIPS, and you see it's skyrockets like 2014, which is nearly five years ago. Number of papers submitted were in like around 2,000. Now it's 6,000, right? It's tripled. And on the right side we have number of attendance of different conferences, and you see that we have this like hockey stick figure, uh, where essentially its number just skyrockets. It's like exponential. It grows exponentially. It's a, a lot of people are interested in this. A lot of people are coming, right? So um, there is a huge interest from industry, from academia. And not just interesting in terms of computer science. Again, it's been uh, used in many, many different areas outside of computer science. And I think it's pretty impressive how many areas AI can touch. Um, I'm going to talk about some future applications that I think, personally, I think going to be uh, one of the uh, pillars of machine learning going forward. One of them is robotics. Nowadays, you don't really hear robotics much. Again, it's, it's still a niche academic field. There are not many, except for like how it's called uh, Boston, Boston Dynamics released some videos, but actually this, the, that particular robot does not have any AI almost, right? It has AI of stability, it has AI, but there's no planning, there's no autonom autonomy in a way, right? Uh, it's not autonomous. It actually has to be controlled with a joystick. But I think going forward, robotics will become uh, more like household word again, and 
it will be a lot of interesting development in this area. Like on the left uh, plot, you can see the what is called like a robot farm in a way. The basically it's just a bunch of a uh, single hand robot has been repositioned to just essentially move the objects, right? And you, uh, on, the, on the top right, you can see one of the robots moving these objects and picking them up. And it sounds like, not doesn't like, sounds like much, right? I mean, what's what's the big deal? But actually, it's pretty, pretty impressive. The uh, computer is not, the robot in this case, is not given any information about the density of the object, its color, its shape, um, how to grab it. And it has to learn everything from the scratch. And in a way, the, when I see this robot, I kind of imagine the kid playing with toy blocks, right? So yeah, we're doing a very literally almost baby steps, right? We are learning things, uh, how to touch them, how to grab them, how they feel, and essentially what toddlers do, right? So yeah, robotics in the very is very nascent almost field, with uh, you know I would say logic of a five months year old or one year year old, but it's we we get in there. I mean, I, I've seen this robot in action. You can give them any object you want, and once they're trained, they can actually learn how to pick it up. Well, not even learn, but just like they go for it. They just pick it up. And it's quite impressive, right? And it's, yeah, it's it's baby steps. But again, going forward, I think it's going to be pretty interesting how it's going to develop. This is another area called federated learning and privacy, uh, which is uh, on some of our buzzword right now in in, in California, and I'm, I don't think people heard about much. Basically, the idea is that as follows, right? Privacy is a big deal, right? You you want to have a huge data set to learn from on a server, but at the same time, you don't want to share this data sometimes. Sometimes it's your health data. Sometimes it's your personal data from your phone. Sometimes it's your photos. You don't want to share them. And also, the learning, on the same time, learning becomes much more... Um, uh, power, uh, it will require much more power, right? You need to have a lot of efficiency you know, to train the algorithm. I was talking about GPT-3 that requires tens of millions of dollars to learn. Well, can we actually do something different, right? Can we, and actually this, this federated learning, in a way it kind of hits two burns with one stone. On one side, we are learning things privately, on the other side, we're doing efficiently. And what they do there, they actually use your personal phone to train on your data while you sleep. So. You plug your phone at night, the system starts running saying, hey, I want to learn the algorithm on your data. I want to leave it on your phone. I want to learn your personalized model while you sleep. And I'm going to use your phone to compute it, which is pretty cool. And then I'm going to share some data with the server that will be differentially private, meaning that it will not have any implication of your privacy. But I will share something that I learned from your phone with my cloud. And then on the cloud, I'm going to have different operations it will also train in a way on this differentially private data that is not shared, that is not your private data, but it's some kind of trace of the data. And I'm going to improve all the phones in the same time. So that not only you train on your phone, but you train kind of in a way that's concomitant of different results, but they are differentially private in the sense that they're, they're, they're private. They don't share any details of your particular data. And this system already been deployed. I don't have a demos here, but some of the Google system that you that if you have Android phone you've been using, you have these algorithms already. Like for example, suggestions when you type, uh, I think on, not on your email, but in your phone, the suggestions you have, they're differentially private and they're trained on your data. Suggestions you see, they're your unique suggestions. They're not being shared with anyone else. So if you see some like your personal word popping up, like your relatives or your co company, don't be surprised it's actually trained on your data. It's not because it's been shared with anyone else that's actually trained on your data and gives you suggestions. And this algorithm will be, I think, more and more powerful because of these two important properties. First, it's trained locally. We don't have to use servers to compute it. In a way, if you combine all the phones in the world, you will have the best supercomputer, right? It's going to be better than any other computer. So the question is how to use, how to harness this power in order to train something useful. Uh, medical imaging. Um, I think that's that's going to be huge, and it's it's already been very very modestly getting into different uh, hospitals and medical institutions. Uh, for now, again, it's very baby step baby steps where we are able to do a, like for example, click, uh, skin cancer classification or prostate uh, cancer grading where we can do it actually better than the human expert. Like on the right top right, we can see the system is able to achieve so the lower is better. We're trying to achieve the lower mean absolute error. And the system, which is uh, shown in dark red, is able to achieve better accuracy, again, lower is better, than the cohort of 29 pathologists, right? And it's starting to move the needle. It's like this system, for example, for the skin cancer classification, oh, I, I forgot, is this skin cancer or the breast cancer? One of the systems is actually being used in this in the one of the hospitals in Thailand or in the Philippines 
uh, with various degrees of successes because it's still very early stages. But again, we can do things better than experts in some way. And of course, it's very sterile laboratory settings, but with real data, with real patients. And I think it's impressive. On the bottom right, we see retinopathy when people with the a certain condition on the eyes, able to achieve again higher accuracy and able to um, find their find the issues, find the find the disease earlier than what they would do with doctor, which is amazing. Um, this is another application that I actually personally involved with a little bit. I'm working in this area, and I think it's fascinating. It's basically social intelligence, right? So far, I've been talking about algorithms that you're given the data and they achieve the solution. They achieve some kind of error rate, they achieve a prediction, but it's only single organism, so to speak. It's only single learning ag uh, agent. What if you combine the agents together? On the picture on the left, actually every pixel is an independent learning machine. It has its own um, set of rules, and so it's, it's has its own network to co collaborate with its neighbors. And the idea is roughly inspired by the salamandras and the flatworms, for example, that are able to regenerate its limbs and tails. And, and also from the generally um, behavior of or development of the fetus, for example, where cells have to self-regulate and self-organize and figure out, hey, I will be a cell of the heart or I will be a cell of a brain. And they have to self-organize, follow a genome to figure out which cell is responsible for what. And they create organs, create organelles, and create body parts. And the picture on the left kind of try to simulate that. Hey, can we have uh, uh, each pixel be its own network? And can we can those networks, by talking to each other, actually talk, talking to its neighbors, uh, recreate the original image, in this case, Halamandra? And on the right, I think it's even more impressive results, where, uh, again, each, each pixel is a network. And the pixel have to talk to its neighbors to figure out, hey, where are we? Are we part of seven? Are we part of eight? Are we part of one? So you see different color of the image represents the prediction of this particular pixel of where they're located. So now it's actually one is turned to seven. They actually uh, neurons talk to each other and figure out, hey, we are in seven. And now that I drew nine, right? Hey, like actually we are nine now. And now this, uh, this argument, are we nine on the four? And in the end, nine wins, right? Again, not impressive from a machine learning perspective, but impressive because think about it, right? All the neurons know is that they are orientation and they position. They don't know what's happening around them well, on the far distance. They just have very local localized neighborhood of the results and able to figure out, hey, like, I think I'm seven. Can you propagate information further? And then they scream, yeah, yeah, say, well, I think we're in seven. And this information has been propagated. And in the end, the whole system agrees that actually we are in seven. I think it's pretty impressive. And I think the social intelligence or learning from one and one source will be also one of the pillars of machine learning going forward. I think it's all impressive, but are we really close to doomsday? And this picture shared by Andre Karpati, one of the directors of Tesla, uh, at Tesla AI, and I love this. I love this image. I love this, what it represents, and I love the kind of very simple intuitive explanation of that we're still doing baby steps, right? If you look at this picture, um, Think about this from the AI perspective. Think about if you are a robot. Think about if you are algorithm of ML. It's pretty hard to understand what's going on. I guess most of us understand that there is a human involved, right? There is a human that uh, Obama, in this case, Barack Obama, steps on the scale to make this person look looks a bit bigger, right? And it's there is a lot of irony here because uh, we, we know implicitly that weight and more, it's kind of negative thing or like me, could be negative. And then in increasing the weight of this person is a humorous, right? This we I kind of parse this joke for you, but we all intuitively understand that. But computers need to know that. that imagine how much data they need to have to, first of all, by the way, think about there are mirrors, right? And there are mirrors in this image. So first, computer can understand that, hey, we need to ignore image and ignore Im uh, mirrors. There are not two Obamas, there is only one Obama. And the second one, on one on the left, you have to ignore. Not easy. Second, we have to understand laws of physics that Obama pressing down with his toes represent that the weight increases. We need to know how scales work. We need to understand the irony that the person is weighting themselves and they're going to weight more. And that's kind of funny. We don't understand why people in the background are laughing. We are not there at all. We haven't some things we haven't even started. And I think this picture represents that uh, we really far from Skynet. We really far from, far from a system that will have some kind of health self-awareness and will kill us all. Um, but we have impressive results still.
Um, people say that there are issues with presentation. Can people confirm that this is okay? Okay, all right, I'll continue. So the second part of the talk um, is life of machine learning algorithm, the way I see that. And I'm gonna talk about five different pillars. Um, uh, first, future selection, uh, future space information, loss function optimization, and regularization. Uh, first is feature selection. Feature selection has uh, long been kind of, in a way, overlooked. Like, unless you're really into machine learning, you don't really hear about that. You think that, hey, we just learn, train some weights, and then you train some method, and then you're done. Uh, but in fact, you have to really prepare your features well. And in a way, it's been obviated. It's been um, made, made, it, it was it became much easier with um, deep learning, but it's still a pretty big problem. And I guess the the message I want to convey here is algorithm performance is as good as your data, and you need to be very careful isolating your learning phenomenon. You have to remove noise and other artifacts from your data that you don't want to be learned from, and you kind of have to, you have to create a good representative test set. On the right, you see three examples of like varying difficulty to see for the data sets. On the top plot, on the top uh, top results, you see MNIST digits, so to speak, it's hundreds in digits. And they these are been this has been used in machine learning um, machine learning applications for the last 20 years. And yeah, in the last 20 years. And uh, um, people use it all the time. And the reason why people use it time because it's clean, right? There's no noise, there's no other artifacts. You have literally a uh, 28 by 28 pixel window with a digit written on it, and there's no other noise. There's nothing else to learn except for this digit. So you can very easily isolate what you're learning from from your results. Uh, but again, this is not representative, right? When you, you or me write digits and we want computer to recognize them, we're, we're going to have different lighting conditions. We're going to have different uh, dark or dark or light, right? We have different backgrounds. We might write more sloppily than others. We might write not with black. We might write with, with yellow, for example, right? Which will be harder to see, right? So in order, again, but you can't really, if you do a lot of pre-processing into removing these artifacts, in, in removing the noise, for example, you might remove some artifacts of a digit as well. So it's kind of trade-off, become a trade-off how much you should clean the data versus where you should learn from the original data. Of course, ideally, you want to learn from the original source, but sometimes it's really hard. So data cleaning is very important. On the, the middle section is very kind of case, very interesting case where a couple of years ago, a couple of researchers, they built an algorithm to recognize whether a person is criminal or not from the mugshot, from the photo, right? And on the top row, they say, hey, these people actually are criminals. This was successfully predicted by the algorithm as a criminals. And on the bottom, uh, in, this, in this row, you can see people that are not, not criminals, right? Uh, and then it was they published the paper, and then it was successful. Uh, well, in a way, successful, right? People it created a lot of fast. People, elder people, start like talking about like Nazism and eugenicism, right? Hey, are we really are we really serious that based on the photo, based on the face, you can recognize criminality? Up until you realize that, hey, like again, algorithm is as good as your data. Look, for example, on the features on the bottom, right? All these people are wearing a tie, uh, a suit, and a color, and 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 a suit, right? And they are slightly smiling, actually. You, cannot, you can almost not perceive it, but they are slightly smiling. Whereas on the top, those people, they're wearing very different attire, and they're slightly frowning. Um, yeah. So, and on the bottom row, you can see exa exa exactly exact example of what I, what I say, right? On the first photo of the Brad Pitt happened to be, we can see the... Sorry, it's just a little bit bugging me that someone has started presenting. Uh, yeah, so you can see on the on the bottom left uh, photo of Brad Pitt, and this is something that again algorithms train for. It's part of I guess Celebrity Hundred dataset, and again lighting is perfect because celebrities usually they like taking pictures in a very nice lighting condition. You can see all the features of the face. Uh, it's pretty nice face to learn from, right? And in the middle you see like a synthesized three D face that people also use. There's like what is like. Uh, what's called synthetic example. And again, it's again because it's synthetic, you can create as, as high definition data as possible. And it's pretty easy uh, to recreate as many as many examples as you want with varying skin conditions. But does it really translate into reality? And on the right, you can see reality, right? You can see what you might actually see in real time. The part of face is occluded, the person doesn't look on the camera, uh, the light is black and white, the color is black and white. So you have to learn from this data too. And you will have this data. If you work with real data sets, you will have this data. 
So um, this is actually a huge part. This is um, when I work in Google search and we work with users and we have to click, uh, click data, uh, we have to create data from the users for the machine to learn uh, the search preferences. It was a really hard problem. Uh, we had to really clean the data multiple times. Not only clean the data and just you're done, you have to really come back to your assumptions. So which assumption you use when you clean the data and revision, re revisit them in order to understand whether your algorithm can be improved by this feature selection algorithm. And other things I want to say is uh, uh, address your implicit bias. What I mean by implicit bias is that imagine you have imbalanced classes, right? You want to have a facial recognition, right? And you have people of different uh, skin color, of different race, and most of the time it will be imbalanced. I, it, I don't think you're ever going to find data set that have exactly the same amount of classes for everything, but you want to learn the algorithm equally well for every 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 class. Sometimes you want to have importance class, right? For a typical example is you want to have a screen cancer patients and you really don't want to miss the person who really has a cancer and you give him or her negative. Um, but maybe it kind of be okay with, again, with the maxima that you should not miss a single cancer through cancer patient, might be okay to give some uh, false positive when people actually don't have cancer and you have them because additionally you can screen them and then you can clarify and make sure there's an error. Whereas if you miss someone with cancer, that's going to be a disaster. Another area uh, really popular nowadays, it's data fairness. Sometimes data will have bias and the algorithm will learn this bias. One of the a typical example I have is uh, where they figure out that um, in, in, in the financial, financial sector, people will not get in credit, credit information because of their race or because of other other things, which at the time was the case because people with different race, uh, they uh, were usually typically poorer and they were typically, uh, they were less likely to, to, to return this credit. And the algorithm picked up not on the fact that they're poor, but the, they, it picked up on the fact that they have different race. So they found some different some bias in the data that actually does exist and pick on that bias. So you need to be very careful. Maybe sometimes you want to reintroduce your own bias in the data in order to fight this original bias. But again, it's become a trade-off, right? Because by introducing more bias, you, the problem becomes more complicated. Finally, most obvious problem, you have different data types. You have Boolean categorical discrete data. Uh, you have sometimes uh, fixed dimensional data, like an image, sometimes you have time series. Uh, how do you mix them all together? And there's no one recipe. You have to try different things. And But um, I guess my point of this slide is that this is a hard problem, and I just want to sympathize with people who start working on this. This is not easy. And a lot of time, you would, if you start doing machine learning, you would spend doing working on this particular, in this particular slide, on this particular feature selection. Um, then I'm going to talk about features and feature space transformation. Once you define your feature space, you want to transform it so it will be easier for the algorithm to learn. And in previous uh, generation of machine algorithm, there are special algorithms specifically for your data to, to create this transformation. Like for example, for image, if you were working in image domain back in the 90s you, or 2000s, you would hear about the SIFT features. And they, are, they stand for special invariant feature transformation, I believe. And it's become a giant thing in the, in the, in back in 2000 before deep learning, where people essentially would spend like I would say on a conference, close to 50% of the papers would just work on the features because it was the way to represent data in image. But what if you don't have image? What if you have something else? Then you have to learn something else. You have to figure out your own custom feature selection tool for work with your data. On the right uh, is and people who work with NLP will recognize this natural parsing trees, right? When you have to impose a grammatical structure on top of language, which doesn't seem like a bad idea, right? I mean, we do have this structure, right? We have adjective and noun and adjectives are connected to noun. And we have this noun phrase, and we have a, uh, I don't know, a PP as a sentence ver verb phrase and prepositional phrase, I guess, PP. So you have this national, natural grammatical structure that you have to impose in order to learn better. Nowadays, you don't need to do that. Algorithms can do it on, the, on their own. And this is kind of one of the interesting part about deep learning. Um, so again, this is this is now. Um, this is this is same image understanding natural language processing now as they are working right now, and you do have some specific things. It's not like it's you have one algorithm to rule them all. We actually working on that. Uh, people try to figure out this one algorithm that works in all the domains. There's still some variations, but it's mostly all of it is neural network. Like on the left, we see convolutional networks, uh, which are specifically designed for 
this translation environment uh, and location environment. So you basically they scan your image left to right with this very specific small kernel and uh, create this like smaller representation of your image. Uh, and on the right, you see transformers. And transformers, you just give an image and it tries to figure out the relation between words in the image. In fact, as as late as last week, I would say, uh, there's, a, there's a paper that uh, just got submitted to a conference called iClear. And this paper claims that you can achieve uh, uh, accuracy of uh, same as convolutional networks for image data set, but with transformers. So maybe transformers will be one model to rule them on. But I guess the point here is that as a practitioner, yes, you have to struggle in a way to represent your features, but once you have your picture represented, you can essentially uh, use this one or couple of algorithms to learn your feature representation. You don't need to worry about, hey, I have image data, so I should I try to sift to other things? It's all been done for you, and it's just one big framework called deep learning. Um, and this is in kind of in one slide, the reason why I think deep learning dominates the world. First of all, it has good results. I actually don't think I have it here as in the slide, but first and foremost, it has a very good performance. Second, it's a universal function approximator, meaning that whatever you're trying to learn, it will learn it for you. And this is not super impressive, but it's pretty important, right? So it doesn't matter what your data you have, it will learn this data. Sometimes too good, sometimes it will overfit in the sense that it will learn something uh, that you not, don't intend to learn. I will talk about it a bit later. But generally, it's a good property to have, meaning that it can approximate anything you want. I already mentioned it's end-to-end -end learning in the sense that you just provide your raw data and you achieve actual classification or regression, whatever you want in the end. It's hierarchical in our learning of features in the sense that you have a deep learning, you have a multiple layers, and in principle, they learn various level of abstractions on each layer. So um, people say that, for example, for image classification, the first layers, they learn kind of very specific information about edges and very local features like edges, and some kind of very small features. And then as you go deeper in the layer, it learns more and more kind of abstract features, such as, for example, if you look in the faces, it learns what an eye is, what the eyebrow is. It connects edges together, different features together in a nested way to learn a better and better abstract representation. Uh, another pillar that is really important is that it has a good performance in particular for distributed settings, trainings, right? Uh, we are dealing with data sets of millions of examples, and it's really hard to learn from. Again, you have millions, you cannot really, you can't really anymore learn data in this original sense of let's just fit everything in one, uh, one iteration and all the data and learn from it. Now you have to learn from batches. You have to separate your data in the smaller chunks called batches, and you have to learn from it in order to achieve your performance. And the deep learning are good in this sense. They can optimize things good in the batch regime in distributed settings. And finally, it's people also overlook that, but it's really important. It's success of automatic differentiation. I remember back in the days when I started my PhD, uh, automatic differentiation was a thing, not as, not as huge as it is right now. And you have to manually write down all your derivatives because most of the uh, optimization is done with derivative methods. So you have to go use your gradient ascent or whatever you have. And you have to manually compute your gradient custom for every method you use. You change number of layers, you have to compute the gradient. You change uh, structure of your network a little bit, you have to recompute the gradient manually by hand. And it was a really tedious process. And nowadays, if you use machine learning, you don't even worry about gradients. Gradients appear as one line, literally one line in your code where you have to do back propagation and you if you're using uh, TensorFlow, for example, you have to tape back the, the algorithm. You don't worry about this anymore. In fact, if you look at the papers, unless it's a theoretical paper, it will not even talk about grad gradients. It automatically assumes that you're using automatic differentiation. It becomes the standard in most of the application papers. Finally, uh, we're going from the feature representation to loss function. Loss function, again, it's, it's the last layer you have in your network. Once you represent your features and you transform it for the uh, for easier digestion, for easier understanding, you have to have a loss function in the end that transforms the parameter space in order to feed the training data. And the loss function defines this univariate error matrix that needs to be minimized, right? So it actually gives you one number for every batch, batch or training set that you have, right? Tells you how good you're doing, right? And you want to minimize this error, right? If you want to have a facial recognition, it tells you, hey, your face actually, we don't recognize it that, that well, right? We have a high error and you want to minimize error. If you're talking about um, 
most of not most actually all machine learning methods they are uh, using this error metric in some way. You, de you define this long loss function, define this error metric, and you're trying to minimize it to the appropriate level. And loss function can be on many types depending on what problem you use. It can be supervised learning, right? You want to classify your objects on a table. It can be unsupervised learning. Hey, can we learn the structure of the data? Like example I show in the very beginning when we just learned the structure of the handwritten digits. Um, well, that's what it is, right? It doesn't have any labels. You just want to learn the structure. Like for example, clustering is an example of unsupervised learning. Or reinforcement learning when you don't have one kind of pass, you don't have one particular set of labels, labels occur once you run the algorithm, right? For example, when you play a game, right, you have a score, the score changes as you play a game. So how do you deal with that? That's another type of loss function you can impose, or it actually changes the whole algorithm. But again, the backbone is still going to be neural network. Or for example, GANs, right? The GANs, you have a mini-max objective, which can be formulated as a loss function, but in fact, it has a play of two loss functions. One is trying to minimize and one is trying to maximize. So how do you deal with that as well? This is all the examples of loss function you have to deal with. Uh, and there can be much more. Again, if we once we talk about social intelligence, they might not be loss function at all, right? Because each particular agent will have to minimize the loss function. And overall, you will not have like a one metric that you're minimizing. Finally, optimization. Optimization, uh, it's interesting because once I, I remember when I created the slide, I wrote negatives first and I was like surprised. Hey, like there are so many negatives. How come it actually works? And let me just leave them because it's kind of impressive, right? That still works. So first of all, you have to have iterative minimization of a loss function using numerical methods, right? So you cannot just find a minimum. You have to start somewhere. The question is, so where do you start? And you go, again, somehow, there's like methods such as a gradient de descent, there's a momentum you can add. There are a lot of different var variants of optimization that you have to use in order to achieve solutions. And you don't even know whether you're there because the objective function is very nonlinear with many valleys and local solutions. So if you're talking about uh, minimization of like now becoming standard like ImageNet, you never achieve minima. You go always down, right? Because it's you once you get close to local minimum, you achieve this valley region and you just go forever in it. And yeah, I mean, yeah, of course you have to stop somewhere because your accuracy doesn't really move much, but actually it does move and you're never really in a true local minimal mathematically, right? Of course, numerically you're almost there, but like mathematically you're never there. And it's frustrating. Then you have to optimize like millions of parameters at once because networks, sometimes billions, right? If you're talking about large networks, we're talking about billions and billions of parameters at once. You can't really interpret them. So you have some numbers and you have this loss function in the end and you have to trust this loss function that represents what you have to learn. And you also have a large data sets, right? And you're not able to work with all of them at once. So you have to use batched, batched um, optimization, which actually just takes few batches at a time, which makes your gradient overall, it's noisy and you just go back and forth. Sometimes actually your accuracy will go down and your loss will go up. So this is all really frustrating, right? So. But how do you even do that? And actually, this is this these four items is ex exactly why neural networks were not really that popular back in the 90s because people look at them and they just okay, done deal. We don't want to do that. That's really hard. Mathematically, we never achieve minimum. There are many lost local minimas. Why don't even bother? But interesting part is that actually does work. It does work. It's it works in batches. It works with stochastic gradient descent. It's available with uh, parallel computation on GPU and neural processing units. Sometimes there is not even local minima. It's been shown that some over parameterized networks, they have all minimas are global minimas. You don't have uh, local minimas at all. And you have a lot of different architectures that are common or different solutions that are common across all architectures, such as dropout when you essentially drop some weights to zero, it actually helps generalization. You have custom optimizers that once discovered can be used for all the methods, such as for example, Atom or Abagrad or as uh, many, many others like Momentum. They are used, they define, they once, and then can be used for multiple problems, not only like for images and NLP, but pretty much anytime you have neural networks. Batch norm has been popular when you uh, avoid the issues of vanishing gradient, when you have many layers together, stuck together. The last layers, they kind of don't really, the, the, the gradient doesn't propagate all the way to them. So you have normalized the weights, it helps a lot. So all, this, all these tools, they actually help learning. And the interesting part is that it, everything, it works. Everything actually works. And... It was a lot of frustration happened there in this, and it's still happening because I remember Geoff Hinton called it, which is he, one, of, one of the guys who actually invented uh, back propagation and many advancement of this. Uh, he actually called it like dark magic, that it all works. And it still is, 
I actually work in this area a little bit, and I can attest that this is works like dark magic. We don't know many things why it works, but it does work. And um, yeah, and if you're researching this area or you have students that want to work in this area, uh, I think this is open field, and we are still in the very, very early days of understanding of why it works, but it does. Okay, finally, once you train your network, you have to check if it works, right? And this is example of, uh, on the bottom you see examples of what I mean by overfitting. Uh, in the three plots you see, we see the increase of model complexity. Let's look at the left plot. You see the points with purple, which is your true data. And the orange is actually a function you want to learn. You don't observe it, but you learn it. Of course, uh, purple dots don't exactly lie on the orange curve because it's been noisy, but it's um, kind of sort of noisy, uh, sampling from this true function. And the blue one on the left curve is the model you learn. And this model, it's just, let's just say polynomial model with uh, only one degree of freedom. In this case, it's linear model essentially, right? And as you see, it's kind of underfitting. The complexity of the model is not large enough to fit your data. Then once you go to three or what, it's a sine curve, right? So you don't have many, but like, I guess three or four degree polynomial, you kind of fit data perfectly almost, right? I mean, there are, it's not exactly what the true function is, but you can see that it's more or less okay. I'm talking about the middle plot. And now if you go into the right plot, if you have this degree polynomial, polynomial with like 15 degrees of freedom, you have the curve that you see on the right with a blue, right? It almost perfectly matches all the uh, purple, but you can tell that it's not perfect. You can definitely tell that we are so-called overfeed the data, that we learn our model complexity class is in a way larger than data ne needs to have, right? So we overfeed it. And it's a big deal, right? You want to understand, you want to have retain a good test set to related performance, and you have to adjust your complexity of the model based on the performance on the test set. And on the left, uh, you can see that that's kind of what we think of the, of with what we thought of the graph of complexity, right? So uh, this risk is basically your loss function and you wanna go down. The complexity of H is complexity of your model, of your model class. And as you go down, you train in the risk, go down, your train loss goes down, right? So you want to, you wanna increase complexity till your loss goes down. But if you look at the test performance, test performance at some point actually goes up and there's a sweet spot, right? You want to increase your complexity up until you hit the sweet spot and your train goes, uh, your test goes up, start to going up and that's where you stop, right? And that's otherwise you overfit. So that's how what we thought. But in reality, as last year, uh, some people from researchers from the University of Ohio discovered this thing called the double descent, right? What we call double double drop, right, in a way. So if you plot on the right, the left part of this plot, essentially what you see on the left, which is indeed, if you increase complexity of the of the deep learning in this, in this case, it goes down the test, error goes down and it goes up again. But then if you can continue increase complexity, it actually continue going down and still stays down. And we don't know how to interpret that. There are some papers that try to hypothesize what's going on, but this is pretty curious, right? You can, in fact, what happens with a really over-parameterized system is that sometimes you have more weights in your, and more parameters in your system than you do have uh, input data. And this is in a classical training regime, this is a big no-no, like you don't have that, you will definitely overfit. If you have more parameters than your data, you will overfit for sure. But with hypnosis, it just doesn't happen. And it's another one of the magics of deep learning that we don't know how to explain. And again, if you if you work in this area, um, I think that's amazing research problems. Finally, uh, I think I'm going to go briefly into future. Uh, I think I have some time. I, will, I definitely want to leave some time for a question for questions, and I'm going to give you some overview over future. Um, this is just my again very very subjective opinion of how I think the field will go. And again, not even the whole opinion. It's just some of the things, some of the things I found interesting. One of them is about Moore's law, and you're all familiar with Moore's law. Basically, the idea is that number of transitions uh, transistors in a circuit doubles every two years. And you see plot here over time how it actually does happen. The thing is, Moore's law is essentially dead. If you actually parse this picture a little bit and you see separate into different uh, different kind of categories, right? Different um, uh, parts of this, of, of what's going on. You see that the sin, sin, like the, in the blue, you can see the single thread performance is actually goes down, right? We don't, like back in the 90s, we heard about, oh, Pentium with 1.4 and Pentium with 2.6 gigahertz. Now it, and it kind of topped out at 3.2, I believe. I don't think I heard any computer bigger than 3.2 gigahertz. And what happening, what, what, what's been happening is that number of cores started to going up, right? I remember this case when you first heard about two cores, four cores, eight cores computers. And again, it doesn't go more than eight, right? So in terms of the 
computational power you have on your laptop, it actually has been changing a while, uh, for a while, right? I mean, of course, we're talking about this new architectures like five nanometers or whatever, or beyond that, or eight nanometers architectures. Yeah, we can push a little bit, but we're actually getting into this like very crowded space where even like at this point, I heard that even the quantum effects are happening because we're packing transistors so, so finally that even we have to understand like quantum effects between things. Plus you have to dissipate heat, right? It's all very... Uh, like nowadays, we're doing really good with with heat, right? But remember, back in the 90s, you have these coolers have to cool your whole system. It's it's it becomes messy and it becomes challenging, more and more challenging, engineering wise. And from this perspective, Moore's law is essentially that. But what happens is that we have a new class of devices called neural processing units. Uh, for example, Google called them TPU, tensor processing units, and they've been developed by many companies. Like you see uh, Intel, Apple. On the bottom right, you see actually this edge TPU device from Google. You have this. You have them in a cluster. You have you can plug them in your computers. There are different devices developed by many companies, and essentially they do very specific specialized operations, which is your matrix multiplication that you need for deep learning, right? But again, because deep learning has advanced so much. We need to invest in those, right? We need to have better results. And I will show in the future slides that you need to have more and more data and more and more compute. So, and this, this actually hardware can help us a lot. Advancement hardware can help us a lot to get better results. And what happened, what I found curious is that efficiency of, of for example, Google GPU roughly doubles every two years. So we have a continuation of the Moore's law, but now in neural hardware. And Coupled together with the fact that the new Moore's law is dead for the actual processors, it's interesting because now it moves towards machine learning. It moves towards more general architectures, machine learning, and better results there. Uh, just to make this point even stronger, look at the computer requirements for machine learning for different algorithms over the years, right? Uh, as you see, it's kind of it, on, 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 the, on the left uh, Axis, you can on the y axis, you can see it's actually exponential, right? It's a log plot, so it's exponentially growing number of requirements, amount of number of resources you need to train your algorithm. And just to make the point even stronger, this is most recent picture, right? So it's the same picture you saw right now. Now it's actually a linear plot, and you see the new algorithm, new Kidon block requires this is a different scale because it's number of parameters, but it still kind of correlates, right? You there are, there are systems right now with 17 billion parameters. And this is not the end because recently, GPT-3 model that I mentioned already has 175 billion parameters. Again, we went from 17 billion to 1.175 billion parameters. Human brain has 86. So it's staggering, right? And we need more and more compute to do that, and we need to have resources to do that. So I think what, what happens is that we have this kind of self-reinforced loop, loop of machine learning hardware, basically, the reason why it's all happening is because you just need to follow a dollar, right? Innovations attract more investment and profit. And the companies cannot squeeze more money from the new iPhone because it becomes 20% better or 10% better in terms of performance. So they have to move somewhere else. They have to understand how the other, other parts work in order to have attract more innovations. And with the death of, uh, death of uh, Moore's law, the innovations are move, have to move in new areas. Uh, improving ML results would require more compute power and more computer power allows for better results. So we have this like self performing loop. We have to have better ML results, which require better software. And because of better hardware, you get better results. And it's gonna continue going like this. And I think that's one of the things why, one of the reasons why machine learning is gonna basically continue growing for the next 10 years or longer. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about alternative approach, what I work for at Google, and I'm really excited about this. I'm gonna ask you to do this very interesting thought experiment to prove you essentially that as we as humans, we don't need terabytes of data to learn from. We don't need to crawl all the internet to learn how language works. We all learn how to speak just with our parents, with our siblings and our friends, and we don't need to have all human knowledge in order to understand how language works, right? So imagine I give you this following exercise. I'm gonna lock you in the room. I apologize if it's too personal, but I'm gonna lock you in the room. I'm gonna give you one by one Chinese characters like you see on the screen, right? And I'm gonna give you infinite time. I'm gonna give you 50 years just in the room, I'm gonna give you one by one Chinese characters. At some point, you'll be bored, you start looking at the characters, and you start realizing that, hey, these characters look similar to each other, I'm gonna put them in this pile. Oh, these characters look similar to each other, I'm gonna put them in this pile. And at some point, in some time, you would 
tell me like, hey, hey, stop, stop, stop. I don't need more characters. I learned all of them. I characterized them by size. I, I, I sorted them by, by, the, by, the, by the, the way they look. I put like, nearby images together. So you still don't know Chinese, but you know the characters. And at some point you tell me, stop, stop, stop. I don't need any more. Of course, it might be in five years, it might be in five months, by mid months, who knows? But at some point you told me, hey, I'm done. I know Chinese. Although you don't speak Chinese, but you know Chinese. That's essentially how algorithms work, right? They decrease the error rate, right? You learn your function, in this case, figuring out Chinese characters, and you decrease your error. But now imagine I'm gonna give you the following. I'm gonna give you Glakolitsa, right? Which is the ancient Russian script. And you probably most people don't know what it is. It, 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 but it has, it's, in a way, it's much simpler than Chinese characters, right? It has only, what is it, 40, 50 different characters. And now I'm gonna give you Glagolitsa. And then in much shorter period of time, you'll tell me, hey, I know what it is. because. Learning Chinese in or learning, right? Figuring out Chinese characters help you understand Glagolica, right? It help you understand what you need to learn. It's gonna be much easier because you learn how to learn. You learn how to understand the characters. You learn the task required to understand the characters. And finally, when I give you the Egyptian numerals, which is just what is it, ten of them, you'll be like, okay, I'm done in like five minutes, right? Because Glagolica and Chinese help you a lot to learn how to learn. So can we can we teach machines how to learn? Can we instead of just giving them task every time a new task, can we teach them hey how to learn this particular problem? Another example I want to give you: look at this picture. This is very specific climbing equipment, and unless you've been into climbing, uh, this probably looks like a mess to you. You don't know what is on the picture. You can maybe separate objects, but you don't know what they for, and you don't know what they are. Now I'm going to give you just one example of what these objects are. In particular, the one on the left is called Cam. And the one in the middle called nut. And you can see example of how it's been used. Essentially climbers stuck it in a crack of climbing because and when you climb, you have a lot of cracks in this, this um, features on the wall and you put this equipment in the wall in order to hold you like you see on the right. And now just with this example, it's much easier for you to separate different objects. Now you know that the blue one are called nuts, the one in the blue rectangle, the one in the red are called cams and the one green are neither cams or nuts. Notice that the camps and nuts are very different in shapes and sizes. Actually, none of them are similar to what I showed you before. This red cam actually doesn't exist in this picture. But you're able to understand, hmm, yeah, I know what cam is. Yeah, cam is this elongated device with kind of crescent shape metal piece on the bottom and has a carabiner at the top. Hmm, I know what it is. And similar to nut, right? So you're able to recognize just from one single example, you're able to recognize what the cam and nut is and then se separate them from everything else you see on the picture. So what did you do essentially? You learn how to learn, right? You learn how to do this, this inference task on your own, right? So in a way, what's happening is that you, you have a kind of two stage of learning. One, when you specifically learn from a given data, like you saw in the image, and the general, when you learn how to learn, right? And you can simulate it in the training examples like this, right? Imagine you have a first data set, just let's call it set number one, which essentially separates cats from birds only. And it's a training problem on its own. You have cats and birds, and you're trying to guess whether the test image would be a bird or cat. Then you have a training set two when you have flowers and bikes, and you're able to you want to recognize whether the test image is flowers and bikes. And you want to learn how to learn. You want to extract learning knowledge from the data set in order to have a test data set. You have a better performance. Again, on a testing site, you would also learn. You still have to learn, but you will use the learning techniques you have before in order to have a better learning. Um, if you look at the nature, it's actually been done already. It's called the genome, right? So we are all learning. We are all as a humans learning, right? We learn from this presentation, hopefully. We learn from each other. We improve all the time. But we also have a genome that, that basically encapsulates all the knowledge we had from previous generations in one uh, particular genome, right? One particular set of a set of uh, instructions. And look at the, this particular baby deer. Actually, I don't think it's a deer, but I forgot the name. Um, it's able to learn and walk within minutes of being born, right? It's been encoded in their genome how to learn, how to learn how to walk, right? They'd never seen the ground before. They didn't know what gravity is, but it's been encoded how to learn how to walk and they're able to do it within minutes. So the question is, can we evolve genome in a way for machine learning that help us learn more efficiently. All right, uh, last about resources and I'm gonna go to questions. 
One thing that is uh, really impressive to me, and actually one of the reasons why I went to uh, industry and academia, is this thing called democratization of AI. If you look at the big companies around the world, especially the companies who are setting the stage for machine learning, they are democratizing AI in a sense that they've been run by ex-professors, most of the companies like Facebook, um, Google in a way as well. They are run by professors of university and the reason why they join industry is because they still want to continue publishing. Everything they do, most of the advancement, I would say, unless it's really part of the core of the company, is being publishing. I work for Google and all the results I do have been published. Many, many people I know, they work for big companies and they publish the results. We want to democratize the AI. We don't want to hold power of AI into in one hands. Uh, most of the algorithms, the same algorithms that we run internally are the one we published and we released them. Uh, when we released this uh, BIRD algorithm two years ago, it was released even before we were able to implement it and run it on Google servers. Sometimes there is, a, there is some time between the publication, but most of the times we publish things right away. In fact, one of the uh, things we, uh, as researchers, we evaluated on is publications. So companies do want to publish and they democratize the process. I, I just mentioned publications, but also in terms of the frameworks we use. Things like TensorFlow, PyTorch, and JAX, they've been developed inside those big companies and they are being easier and easier to for use for people. Like you see on the right, the typical example of very easy ML algorithms, it can fit the screen. It's very easy. You load your data, you define your architecture, you compile, you feed your data, and you print the accuracy. It's that easy. It's everything, all the nasty, dirty details go under the hood. And nowadays, the frameworks that you use are very easy to use, even for people who don't program much. In fact, that's why it's written in Python, because we want people to use it, even who are not like very familiar with, uh, with uh, software development. Uh, there are a lot of learning environments, right? Uh, Jupyter, Colab, and GitHub allows you to easy to parse, store your data, commit your changes. I guess it's been used by many people nowadays, but it's also been used by machine learning. You have a specific instances. Uh, some of them actually free to try, right? If you go to Google Cloud, you can try training on TPU and GPU. I think you still can do it. I'm actually not sure, but I think you can do it for free. Uh, well, you have to pay if you wanted to like enterprise large size, but still. And in fact, like Google Cloud, if you compare it to Microsoft Azure and AWS, one of the competitive advantage of Google Cloud is that we offer very extensive suite of machine learning tools that you can use off your bat. You just need to give uh, give us your data or like give us your data, uh, provide data, and then uh, you can learn from the data using predefined algorithms. Uh, if you develop in algorithms, there are tons of benchmarks, there are tons of competitions and different environments where you can, cha uh, you can cha check your algorithm. And finally, literature, it goes beyond just universities and papers. There are many tutorials, courses, online classes, and most algorithms you don't have to read the papers anymore. You have to. You can just read the implementation. There are multiple implementations. There are multiple tutorials to help you understand. Um, I'm going to go very briefly to off common myth of machine learning. Um, I'm, I'm actually not sure if the audience uh, for like follows this, uh, but some people have this this misconceptions, and I'm just going to try to to clear them out. First one is machine learning is the inclusive subfield of AI. I think I was able to show that machine learning is basically a working horse that helps achieve state-of-the-art results in many sci uh, scientific and industrial applications. And again, the emphasis here on many, right? It's not just computer science anymore. Uh, machine learning is able to achieve results in biology, chemistry, physics, you name it. Any field is affected. Uh, then it's hard to write code machine learning. Well, again, with uh, new libraries and new tools, it's very easy. Sometimes it fits one screen. Yes, it's it's still to work. I don't want to say it's trivial. It's not trivial. It's hard, but it's easy. It becomes easier and easier over time. Last one, you need a PhD to understand what the paper algorithm does. It might have been the case previously because the, it was really hard to reproduce results and get on the fields. But nowadays, there are tons of materials on the web explaining every detail of popular algorithms. There are very many tutorials in any language you want. There is a very active community that can also help you. Uh, if you have any errors and, and just post any, any error on YAX, which is a system for like query, query question answers. Uh, people are very uh, helpful. And actually, there are many, many uh, people who actually knows about machine learning and can help you much more than the world like five years ago. Finally, resources. I put mostly English language resources, uh, but I'm sure there are also in different languages. Online courses has been really popular. What I really follow is MIT Stanford classes. They've been published every year. You have video, you have slides, you have information available. There are a lot of stuff you can learn from, like from really best universities, from best professors, from the sometimes authors of the papers themselves. 
Other sources I follow, essentially YouTube also, there are a couple of people who explain uh, papers really well, like there is two minute physics, two minutes papers channel that I follow that explain like and like one paper per week, I guess, in two minutes. There are many tutorials and blogs that I follow, and uh, sometimes they actually written in a really nice way, easy way. Yeah, sometimes they don't give all details of the paper, but they explain things really well. And sometimes they summarize things. It's in fact, many many uh, people right now move from this publication into more like blog sphere. Or previously, you as a scientist, you've been uh, mostly. Um, uh, evaluated based on your papers, but nowadays, actually, some blogs uh, I actually have almost same weight as a, as a publication, especially as a lot of comments, a lot of views. Of course, conferences, if you want to follow conferences, sometimes papers are hard to read because uh, there, we don't really have journals in the field, we have mostly conferences, and conferences, they are eight pages, very strict limit, and sometimes they pack a lot of material because conferences are very competitive, you have to publish papers, and they have like 20-30% acceptance rate at the conferences. Uh, you have to pack a lot of information in the paper, a lot, a lot. And sometimes it's, it becomes very dense, it's very hard to read. So it's very good source to, if you want to get complete picture or cut an edge result, but um, it's pretty hard. I just want to acknowledge that. If you really want to have bleeding edge results, then you probably should go to archive. Archive publishes, when people researchers essentially publish very fresh work, it's not even haven't been peer reviewed here. So there's a lot of volume, like 50 papers a day. And obviously you don't look at all of them. You either find, follow your favorite authors or follow, follow your favorite topic. It's pretty huge amount of information, but it really gives you the bleeding edge results. It's really hard to read because it's not been peer reviewed. And finally, what I follow the most actually, it's just informal uh, channels such as Twitter. I use Twitter. I know it's social network generally, but for me, Twitter is mostly academic. I follow a lot of academics. It's one of the best way to access the authors because most of academics, they when they publish results, they advertise it on Twitter. And a lot of first authors uh, or authors of the papers I meet there. And it's a really great way to just have academic chatter and like see what's up, what's important right now. It's sometimes overhyped. People tend to overhype the results, but if you follow the right people and you basically spend some time doing that, uh, you will find a lot of useful information there. Plus, authors are really responsive. You can actually really comment. They, they will be pleased and honored to answer your questions. If you, I think it's one of the best way to contact the authors as well. You can obviously mail them, and many people will respi- reply. But even famous people, like people people that are known in the field, they are very happy to answer your your questions if you have them. And finally, things I don't really follow much, but I know it's been really popular. It's Reddit. Uh, it, Reddit has 1.4 million members, which is a huge number, and it's very active. People discuss papers, people share different resources. I don't really follow it much, but I know it's been really popular source. Finally, for the final words um, for educators out there, uh, I want to say that modern machine learning, or deep learning, is only 10 years old, but it's it's a fast growing mature field. And I encourage you, if you if you work in the education field, please invest in ML education. It's, it's going to pay off soon. It's going to it's going to not replace software engineering, but it's going to augment software engineering. Like ML skills will be really useful. And if you work in uh, computer science education, please make sure that you have uh, up to date ML um, teachers, professors that can teach students this area. Again, it's not you can just reuse slides from different. Uh, presentations that are from MIT and Stanford. You can use other things. There are many, many resources available. You can, there are even te- textbooks nowadays. Textbooks still, they lack two or three years, uh, but there's also te- te- textbooks on this in this area. For academics out there, it's very active in developing skills, especially if you have math skills. One one thing that I'm, I'm, I'm really kind of pleasantly surprised every time is that each time I go to conferences and I see very, very few people from Eastern Europe and in, in Ukraine in specific, I maybe last time I went to New Rips, I saw two or three papers, not even the first author from people actually from Ukraine. Of course, there are expats, people who work from outside for different companies, but there are very few people, papers from Ukraine. And actually, if you have math skills, it's actually not like, I just outlined a few for problems. I mean, of course, I outlined a very broad uh, strokes, but um, there are a lot of problems that, very specific problems that uh, if you have good math skills, it's not, it won't be that hard to publish. And it's, uh, very prestigious and it opens many doors and it's you can apply for grants you can join companies if you that's what your goals are or just build your academic career i think i think we definitely need to increase uh, presentation of eastern europe in those conferences uh, you can actually apply for grants from the companies directly if you have uh, good presentations and you have good uh, uh, good papers you can apply grants from outside from the conference uh, for, from the companies directly google uh have a very huge amount of grants that they give out every year to faculty members and many companies, other companies do the same. 
And again, given that you are from, you might be from a different country, it doesn't really matter from what I understand. Uh, cross collaborations are very welcome. Um, again, machine learning is a tool on its own if you want to study that, or it can be used for any many other fields, right? If you work in biology, chemistry, any other scientific fields, uh, please continue, please use machine learning and it will help you if you have any data, even if you have a small amount of data, it still will help. And finally, for industry folks, uh, one thing I see from here, from California, is that we're kind of moving from this language-centric to application-centric world, right? There's no more Java developer, Python developer. We have more like a focused application base, right? We have a front-end, back-end, and finally we have ML developer. There are ML developers, and I think we're more and more moving to this world of do you have software skills or you have ML skills? And People will require, require to have both very soon. A lot of people start working into ML field. Google last at least five years has been called itself as the AI first company, right? So we invest a lot in ML. And if you are industry folks, and if you haven't picked up ML, please do start doing so. And yeah, it's going to be growing the amount of ML specialists in the future. Um, thank you so much. This is my last slide, and I'll be happy to take questions if there is time for that. Uh, Max, please uh, see chat and uh, question in chat. I'm sorry, but I I think my headphones are off. I'm gonna Max, say, start them. Say, uh, I apologize. I cannot hear the questions. I'm sorry. And uh, let me. I think I have issues with my speakers. Yeah, uh, now I can hear you. Yeah. You hear me? Yeah, now I can yeah. hear you. I apologize. Yeah. I was not uh, able please, to hear see, see chat. Uh, some questions yeah. are in chat. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the first question is, I ask you to elaborate on the latest in deep learning techniques. What methods have you developed or participated in the development? Uh, repeat slide with methods. There are a lot of stuff, and I just mentioned very few. And slides, by the way, if you want, I can share later. Uh, these are probably the slides that you that you want to see. Um, I specifically work on this method that I showed before, which is uh, it's called nonlinear dimensional reduction when you're trying to understand the data. And I have some papers on improvement of the methods, make them work faster and more robustly, and in a large data sets. And like for example, back in 2010, before any batch learning or anything, I was able to learn. Uh, like one data sets of sizes of millions, which again, now it's not impressive, but at that time it was pretty impressive. Uh, then uh, at Google, I was working, and at Yahoo, I was working on the one of the first deep net, uh, deep net engines for search, but it never really was launched. And for, um, for Google, I was working on this meta learning techniques now and new architecture search, where I try to find a better architecture and also try to learn the optimizers, learn the uh, machines to learn, basically, so help help machines to learn. I hope that answered the question. Uh, thanks for a very interesting talk. There are two questions. From your point of view, there are, are there some perspectives to apply ML methods to real support, such as process and SE? For example, complex software system maintenance, bug detection, testing, re-engineering, etc. It's already going. It's already going. It's very active. Um, one of the areas that I'm fascinated about is uh, systems that can write code um, and it's already happening. So you, like this GPT-3, this last point over here, there are demos out there. You type, for example, I want to sort these numbers and the computer spits out the code to sort for you. Of course, it might not compile. There's no guarantees of it to compile, but it helps you. There is a, a very fascinating software that I haven't used that will help you to write code. You write your code and it tells you, hey, you actually, you instead of uh, I, you meant K here, actually. And you look at code indeed, like you mistype, it should be K. Not only to correct syntaxes or highlight syntaxes as modern like IDEs do, but actually help you to understand the right code. This is not perfect, it's very nascent, but uh, it's definitely there. Find, find bugs, same thing. I think what you're saying is very huge area that is being actively developed. And there is a lot of perspectives for sure. Uh, it's maybe not as impressive. I think it's impressive, actually, honestly. What Even what we have right now is impressive. It's maybe not out there to right now to 
being used uh, right like off from from the bat but uh, i think it's pretty interesting second question what is your private estimation for knowledge education level of students who come now from universities into the modern it companies uh, this is actually one thing that i haven't uh, mentioned at all and i think it's pretty interesting to to talk about which is exactly that like what ooh, big big software companies what are requirements for the students and what i would say they are much less um as you would think, right? They are much smaller as you would, as you would think. Uh, you need to know math a little bit, you need to know linear, linear algebra, you need to know you need to have software skills. One thing that is not being actually actively mentioned in especially Eastern European, I think I did a presentation a couple of months ago to a bunch of developers from Eastern Europe, and they were surprised to learn that one of the main skills companies ask for is algorithms. So different sorting methods, different ways to optimize your code, your complexity, everything that Gregory Kalajalkevich teaches is actually very relevant. <laughs> and I'm really grateful that it was helpful for me to, in, in a way to get to Google as well. Um, and uh, yeah, and if you know algorithms well, I know it sound, it's it's actually kind of joke within the community because yeah, you know, you know how to sort, you know, you certain methods, so what, right? It doesn't really help you. But essentially it's one of the requirements for uh, for entering big companies because although these school skills might not be used directly, but uh, it, allows you to check whether you know um, what you're doing at all, right? Um, yeah, hope I answered your question. Let me know if, uh, I think I might not answer some part of it. Please let me know if you need the clarification. Next question, is Google making or intend to make any research of generalized strong AI? I guess what what the question, what the questioner means is um, uh, whether we're talking about like uh, AGI, what's it's called, and like advanced general intelligence. I don't, maybe strong AI, I'm not completely sure what strong AI is. And this, for me, it goes back to, like, I guess what I mean is just this general tool that able to learn, have a continuous learning and improve. And yes, people talk about it, but it's one of those like hype things that is not very clear for the actual practitioner what it actually means, right? Because I think it's important to talk about it. I think it's very important to have this on the table as the piece of information and the discussion to have. But again, for me, it boils down to this picture, right? Up until the computer is able to understand that, hey, this is irony, I'm very skeptical that this comes close. Uh, I'm more concerned about like more practical and interesting approaches that we can actually do, right? Like this one, this approach that you see, I'm fascinated by it. I think it's amazing that uh, different uh, pixels, just by talking to its neighbors, able to understand whether they are in nine or one. And this is, I think it's in a general sense, it's really far from AGI or strong AI, but it's fascinating and it's amazing that we can do that. But this is the very baby steps, right? Of course, if you show this to someone who believes in Skynet and say, hey, Skynet will be developed next year and you show that and they will say, yeah, you, are you kidding me? This is trivial, but it's impressive. Um, next question, what tools can you suggest to deal with hyperparameter student and neural network optimization? Is there anything except grid search and random search? Yeah, a lot, a lot of stuff. Um, there, is a, there is a project called I know, I know internally for Google, but it's been published uh, ex externally. It's basically uh, use Gaussian processes to understand your parameter space in order to find it better. So you basically specify the range of your hyperparameters and the system will automatically run it for you. There is tools called AutoML, if we're talking about beyond hyperparameters, but actually uh, uh, architecture search, AutoMLs will run different versions of your architecture and try to help you find the better, better architecture. Um, there are many other things. Um, honestly, I, as a practitioner, use, still use grid search. So none of these methods are actually perfect. And I will just, okay, I know that's it. That's all the problem is solved. You know, I know how to tune my hyperparameters. That's it. Um, but I think it's pretty impressive that there are still methods that, that help you with that. If you want, by the way, all, uh, all of you are welcome to reach out to me privately. If you have any additional questions or one more clarification, I'll be happy to answer. Um, I think you can find, if you just type my name, you can find my email um, my, on my personal website. Uh, next question, are there any AT, uh, AI solutions for security and privacy issues, perhaps also predictions, social engineering cases? Um, I unfortunately don't really work with security and privacy issues. I know a little bit about these differential privacy things where you are, I think this example what I give. Yeah, example where I give. So basically when you want to learn data on the server, but you don't want to share data with them. I think that's what um, the author of this question meant, but I'm not sure. I'm not really familiar with that. I know it's a, it's a huge area and it's very important for many companies 
and there are a lot of advancement. Um, unfortunately, I don't really follow that. Uh, share presentation, I think I will share it with Grigory Zelkevich and he would put it somewhere. I think that's the easiest way, if there is easier way. Um, yeah, Mikhail Ogrimov, I will I will follow up with Grigory Zelkevich with the slides and then he can share it with you. I guess Grigory Zelkevich will answer that. Yeah, I think that's, that's all the questions. Uh, if any other questions, I'll be happy to answer. If not, please reach out to me offline. Thank you.